All right. Welcome everyone to this Q&A. Again, welcome everyone uh, to this Q&A. Hope everyone uh, recovered from Purim, whoever uh, celebrated. So I'll make an observation, not really a uh, question, but we'll see where this uh, see where this goes. Uh, someone just told me recently, you know, about problems about, um, you know, conversion and you know, what, what was the issue or what is somewhat uh, the issue? The issue is they converted by somebody, took classes from you know, the same person who was on the basin or assigned on the basin, which not necessarily a contradiction, right? Someone gets classes can also be on the basin. Uh, could also be in the rabbinical court as one of the, you know, one of the three rabbis there, but okay, right? Without getting Without getting into all that, the person is, let's just say, I'm not gonna say necessarily controversial, right? I don't know the person, I don't know the person well, um, you know, at all, but let's just say not recognized in most places. Yeah. So now person has a conversion from an Orthodox rabbi, quote unquote, right? Three, you know, rabbis. Sign. I mean, not sure, hundred percent. They were um, rabbis or not, but okay. Regardless, as long as they're, you know, as long as they keep Shabbos, right? As long as they keep Shabbos, you know, it should be good enough. The conversion's done okay. But the the question always is, is that, and most people are not aware this is the problem, right? This this is essentially the problem. And that is that people, um, you know, the the issue is, is that if you if you listen to somebody that, you know, let's say, um, they're going to call into question the conversion itself, right? If they're going to call in the in the the question of the conversion, now let's say again. You know, the person is orthodox, let's say. What's what's the problem here? Right? What um what is oops what is the issue? Right? What what's the issue? The issue is if someone, let's say, is not recognized, or the conversions are problematic, which is let's say, but even if the person is orthodox, right? Let's say what what's going to be the question? Question's going to be a what they what they taught. Yeah, is their knowledge up to par? Is their knowledge up to snuff, so to speak? And now this person's in limbo. This person is essentially in limbo. What what's the reason? Because you don't know what they taught them. You don't know what level of knowledge, you know, necessarily, you know, that the person has. Right. So we're not going to say, you know, we're not going to say, well, you know, if it was a reform conversion or a conservative conversion, very good. Much easier. Much, much easier. Throw it out. Someone once someone's asked me, um, you know, if I had a conservative conversion, you know, if I had a conservative conversion, it's going to help me. I said, no. It's going to make my life more difficult to re squeegee your brain, get all the garbage out of your brain. But okay. <laughs> kind of deflated by that comment, right? But I said, the people teaching you don't know what they're doing. You know, if you ask, you know, like, you know, my wife is becoming religious. She asked a conservative rabbi, you allowed to ride a bike on, on Shabbos. He goes, you want to know what I do? So I know, I don't really care what you do. I want to know. <laughs> According to Jewish law, you allowed to ride a bike or not. He said, I ride a bike on Shabbos. Yeah, that's a fourth and long. That's called the punt. American football terms. Just say, I don't know. <laughs> Just say, I don't know, according to Jewish law, whether you're allowed to, you know, whether you're allowed to, what do you call it? You ride a bike or not. Be honest. <laughs> Just say, you don't know. You want to know what I do? Or care what you do? Or we care what you do? Could you tell me, according to the code of Jewish law, what it says? Yes or no? Right? Very simple. This is my post, uh, my post porum kick now coming down from the, you know, the hive, the wine here, get me a little bit groggy and whatever, right? 
you learn from somebody, yeah, they got to know what they're doing. Does that mean they're going to be impeccable? Does that mean they're going to be perfect? Does that mean they're going to be perfect? Right? The Gemara in, in, in Chagiga says that, you know, Rabbi, you're going to learn under, right? You have to look at them like an angel. Now, it doesn't mean they're perfect. No one says they're perfect, right? Everyone's got flaws, right? There's no question. But if you're learning with somebody, or let's say better, from somebody, yeah, that's questionable. And their conversions are questionable. The knowledge you got is questionable. Now, could be some of the things they taught you were true. Yeah, maybe they some of them were, you know, maybe they got, you know, a lot of knowledge. Maybe. The problem is people are going to look at it as being skewed. It's skewed. Right? Got a question a while ago, right, about, you know, synagogue. Should I go to this synagogue or that synagogue? Or is this good or is that good? I get this question all the time. Right, different synagogues. So one of the synagogues is is a rabbi from what we call open orthodoxy. Now, why do they call it open orthodox? You know what they say: your mind's open, so your brains fall on the floor. Yeah. So there's somewhere between, I would say, conservative and maybe modern orthodox. Maybe. Right. Certainly, not all modern orthodox rabbis hold to this group. A. B. Certainly, the other orthodox don't hold to them because a lot of things they say go against Torah. They go against Torah, period. <laughs> right? There's a whole laundry list of things. It's not, uh, you know, it's not like I'm fishing for things, you know, so to speak. They don't want to have women rabbis. They call them a maharats. Well, what's the difference? Is there any real difference? No. They straddle the line and rely on things. They shouldn't rely on, period. Period. So, so going there, yeah. Person will call themselves orthodox. Orthodox is a very broad term. Very, very broad term. Yeah. But at the very least, you have to believe the, the Torah is from God. God passed it down to Moses. And that's what we do. And we listen to rabbinic law. Right? We listen to what the rabbis tell us. We don't, you know, we're not looking for leniencies for the sake of leniencies. We're not looking for Webster's fifth definition and reinvent the wheel. We're not looking for that. We're not looking for innovation. Now, they want to say, we don't need a machitza, let's say. You know, we don't need a separation between men and women, or a small separation, or, you know, I want to know how many women, you know, belong to these synagogues to actually cover their hair, that are married. The modern Orthodox community could ask the question in some places. Some will cover half their hair, part of their hair, you know, but it says you got to cover all your hair. I mean, you have to shave it, you have to cover it. If some of it comes out, okay. But you have to cover the whole thing. Someone wants to ask me, so I don't understand. I say, well, wear a baseball cap and half her hair is hanging out like Mark Fidrich, right? I remember Mark Fidrich? Yeah, baseball player, pitcher, right? A lot of hair, right? And a lot of hair. Any case, you wear a baseball cap and ain't covered all your hair. At best, right? So you say, what's the permissibility for that? You gotta ask them. Right? Some women say, you know, you know you know, some women there won't cover their hair at all. They say, well, isn't it better to do something than nothing? Depends. Depends. Yeah, if it's going to help you grow and you're working on it, okay. Right? You get to where you need to get. If it's something where this is the best you're going to do and that's the standard, that's the problem. Give another example. Another example. Yeah. People ask me a lot, what about the conversion of Ivanka Trump? Yeah. You got to say, someone's going to say, well, you know, the way she dresses. Yeah. Short sleeves, short skirts. She doesn't cover her hair. Right? She doesn't cover her hair. She's married. How can she not cover her hair? Right? So now, so, so people would say, if it's something you didn't know about, it's now difficult for you and it's going to take time, okay. If a woman says, I'm never going to do it, what happened? Someone asked uh, my husband's question once after he gave class. A woman comes in and says, you know, she converted. She didn't know she had to cover her hair. So she's having difficulty covering her hair. Is that considered, does that make the conversion invalid? So he said, no. Not everyone's supposed, you know, not everyone's going to know everything. 
If it's something that she would have said, I'll never cover my hair, right? In a hundred lifetimes, they're not, that's it. They're not going to convert her, right? In other words, the person would say, I'm going to keep everything except each trip. Next. There are no conditions. If somebody didn't know and now they're having difficulty, that's not a rebellion. They didn't know. So, if I told my rep, you tongue and cheek, she would have been in my class and she would have known that. That's something she would have known. So, I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, no, no, this is, you know, this is immoral. You can't do that. You got to teach people this. He goes, okay, I got the point. It's like, I got the point. Yeah. So, so now, back to the back to Von Control. Is she not covering here because it's a rebellion against God? No. Why not? Because that's the standard in some modern Orthodox communities. So, women don't cover their hair. Why? I can't answer. I don't have an answer. Because the Gemara says a woman's hair is considered licentious. So a woman's hair should be covered for everybody else except her husband. Even if she got a period, she can still uncover her hair. It doesn't matter. The point is, she's allowed, she's allowed to uncover her hair in front of her husband, not anyone else, if she's married. Now, when it says her hair, it means all her hair. The Gemara doesn't make any distinction. The Gemara doesn't say, oh, part of it. <laughs> Let the rest hang out. There is a leniency if a if a tefach, if a hand's breadth came out from underneath her, her scarf or her snood or whatever. You know, okay, we're not gonna, you know, sit there and whoop her. Fine, it can happen. But to set that to standard and let other hair hang out, right? That's forbidden. Right? But you know, in some modern Orthodox communities, not gonna trash all of them. In some of them, women don't cover their hair. So why isn't she covering her hair? Because that's the standard where she goes. If that's the standard, it's not a rebellion. It's not a rebellion. So what about the rabbis that convert them? Oh, good question. Don't they know? Shouldn't they know you have to cover your hair? They should know. This is pretty basic. Yeah. So if they know what the halacha is, how do they convert them like that? Now, does that mean Allah, the, the conversion is not valid? No. Doesn't mean it's not valid. That's their standard. Ah, it's the wrong standard. Okay. It's not the right standard. Yeah, but it's not, it's not like they're saying, I don't believe in God, or I'm not going to keep kosher, or I'm not going to do other things. That's their standard. When it's somebody's standard, okay, they, you know, there are different levels here, right? We're not talking about where someone's a heretic, where someone denies God, someone denies one of the 13 principles, right? Or the Rambo. Right of Maimonides. That that's a different issue. And if a person says, I'm not, you know, I'll do everything, but I'm not going to do this, that's a different issue. That they're saying, I'm doing it on condition. No conditions. But if that's the standard, even if it's a weak standard, uh, even if it's a weak standard, yeah. Even if it's a weak standard, okay, but that's their standard. That's their standard. But you know, I've gotten this question many, many times. Many, many times. I know people grew up on Orthodox. You know, whatever they said, that, that's not a question. Because that's what a lot of people do. <laughs> they don't cover their hair. Why? I don't have an answer. I don't have an answer. Yeah. So the question, the, the question is, you know, as we always say, it's carpenter law. You're going to do it. You do it right. If you're not going to do it, don't bother. Right, but don't try and jump through hoops and say, "Oh, but we hold by, you know, Webster's eighth definition on this or on that or on the other." Either you're going to do it, you do it right, or not. Torah is not a pretzel here. Cannot turn the Torah into a pretzel. Yeah. So when you do this, and you play games, you get burnt. You possibly get burnt here. Now, now for some people. For some people, they understand what they're getting themselves into. Other people, not that way. Other people say, oh, this person's orthodox, got you know good reviews, this and that. So I'll go with them, very good. But they don't know. This is where the problem comes up. You got to do your research. You got to do your research. I had someone once going to start my classes, so they want to check me out. So the first thing I put on my blog is with my rabbis. Right on my rabbis. Says, God, you know, so I get a call a few days later. You know, you know who this person is. You know, he wrote this book and he sits on the rabbinical court. I said, Of course I know who he is. Yeah, the fact he let me in is a big miracle, but okay. 
Yeah. Can I have credentials? Yeah. Does another person have credentials? No, no, I haven't checked them out so well. You know, maybe he has some credentials, maybe. But if, if in general, the person is not necessarily accepted, you know, in the, you know, in the conversion, quote unquote, world, and the rabbis will know them, then yeah, that's a problem. Now, it's a problem. Now, it's very easy to get blackballed, right? A person comes up with certain rulings that, you know, can ruin a person. Totally ruin a person. People say you can't listen to them, right? So, you know, a person got to be careful what they say, no question. But, you know, go by reputation. You know, what do their students look like? Are they getting the right information? These are serious questions. Again, they could dress the part, they could talk the part. The question is, what did the person get? And that's whatever. That's not so easy to determine. Why not? You got to, you, you, you know, you got to examine them. You got to see what they read. You got to see what they learned. Now, maybe some things they learned well. Okay. Maybe other things not. But if the person's problematic, everyone's going to call in the question the conversion. And then they're going to say, you know, they're going to say, okay, you know, maybe he had an ulterior motive, maybe this. So they're going to be even more skeptical. It puts more obstacles, you know, it puts more obstacles in the way. Now, it could be the person didn't know. That happens. person didn't do enough research, didn't speak to the right people, whatever it is, right? And that's what happens, right? That's essentially what happened. So now, because of that, they got burnt. So you got to be careful. I had somebody tell me, oh, I bought all these books or whatever. So they started telling me the names of the books. <laughs> and I, I, so I said, I said, you know, you should have done this. Be, you know, you should have told me this before, you know, you bought these books. I'm very much aware of a lot of, you know, a lot of books that are written by art school, by fell times. They're good. They're not good, you know, by the authors. So for I don't know, four or five books, I was like, get a chuckle. Yeah, you got to be careful what you read. You got to be careful what you listen to. Right? Not everyone orthodox is good to listen to. Doesn't matter what their following is. See, that's that's the big misnomer over here. You say, look, you got 10,000 views, 50,000 views. Is it? You're right. Okay. Yeah. Are they saying the truth? It's not about numbers. It's about truth. Yeah, you got people saying things. <laughs> you know, they can have a million views. Very good. But if it goes against Torah and makes them into a heretic, what is it worth? Yeah. And, they'll, you know, and they'll say they're authentic and they'll say this. You know, someone get out there and say, well, you know, I know the, you know, I know the other Orthodox be upset with me, you know, for saying this. But, you know, someone who's two, three years old, they're playing with dolls, a boy. Like, you know, what do you think? It ends up being gay. It's not his fault. Not his fault. What do you do with Exodus, with Leviticus chapter 18? You know, say he's born that way. <laughs> if he's born, you know, it, it happens. I just spoke to someone recently. They were born with both. Right? You know, with both um, sexual organs. So the parents made a choice. Kid can't make a choice. Kid never would have lasted, you know, you know, through school. So parents made a choice. This person claimed they made their own choice. Made the choice of a of a of a of a boy. This person felt they were a girl, you know, and change change back, or change everything back. Although whatever, it's a whole question on that. It could be that that's not necessarily an issue today, because they may. I mean, it's a complicated case, right? Could be that they were they really felt they were a girl and they had you know girl organs, but the parents felt no. Parents felt there's a boy. And they made the wrong choice, you know. Let's say. Right, so so that's not so clear cut over here, you know. It's much more complex, right? But at the end of the day, you know, at at the end of the day, someone's gonna say they're born that way, right? So the guy says, "I want to call him Rabbi." But the guy says, "Like, what do you want?" He's playing with dolls once he was two years old. What did you expect? What did you expect? Because I know, I know, the other world is gonna get upset with me. Of course, we're gonna get upset with you. <laughs> Because Leviticus chapter 18 says he's going to pay the price. Right? But his argument was, you think he's really going to pay the price? Really think God's going to get him? And God's going to zap him later? 
What's the Torah say? Can't be homosexual. Can't act on it. There's a question if a person has homosexual thoughts and they don't act on it, right? Okay, you know, bad enough you have the thoughts. Okay, you don't act on it. It's one thing. You act on it. It's the same punishment, same corporal punishment if there'd be a temple in Jerusalem today is desecrating Shabbos in public. It's the worst punishment. Yeah. But I know the outdoor Orthodox are getting upset with me. Thank you very much. Heresy. Heresy. They say, oh, you just don't get as many views. Not a question of getting views or not views. Right? Is it true? Is it true what this person is saying? The answer is no. That child, that child grows up, becomes homosexual. Because they, they, they're in the wrong body. Yeah. They have the wrong gene. <laughs> we got a lot of bad genes. We got anger genes. We got miserly genes. We got I don't want to help other people genes. I don't want to wake up early to pray genes. I don't like the matzah genes. Got a lot of bad genes. Right? Like someone said, you know, <laughs> you're around with them and he was born that way. I was like, really? Science hasn't proven that. He was born that way. Don't give me any lip. He's born that way. <laughs> I got one line in. And that line was, science has not proven it. And even let's say, I'll be generous. Let's say, because I'm in a generous mood here, right? Let's say science did prove it. Let's say person had X bad gene, homosexual gene, anger gene, whatever it is. Let's say they had that gene. Now, aren't they in a worse position than other people? Yes. Don't they have a certain bias against them? Yes. Does God want them to act on it? No. We're going to say, God wired me that way. What's God's gonna answer gonna be? I'll play God here, put on my funny George Burns glasses. It'll be almost, you know, like poor him, my funny mustache. And what would I say? You're right. I wired you that way. Very good. I gave you 10 times more anger genes than I gave anyone else. But guess what? I wanted you to work on anger. I made it much harder for you than other people. True. God will say 100%. You're right. I didn't say to act on it. But you wired me that way. You made it that much more difficult. So what? People don't have anger genes. People don't want don't have seduction and want to give charity genes. Right? They got all kinds of bad genes. They are wired with not that they did it to themselves. They did it to themselves something else. Well, let's say you have a certain DNA. You have certain bias. Someone grew up. Parents were alcoholics, yeah? What's the likelihood they're going to be alcoholics? Pretty good. Now, is that what God wants? No. Are they at a disadvantage more than others? Yes. Okay. But that's what they have to fight against. Other people have other things to fight against. Everyone's got whatever the evil inclination is that they have, whether they did it to themselves or, or even if you want to tell me they're wired that way. But what's God going to answer? What in the world is God going to answer here? You know what God's going to answer? He's going to say, you're right. I didn't tell you to act on it. Because you acted on it, you get punished. But you wired me that way. So what? <laughs> what difference does it make? How I wired you? I wanted you to work on it. So, I, so you have a worse disposition in that case than other people. And this person has 10 times worse disposition when it comes to poverty than you have. And they got other issues. Yeah, everyone has. Everyone has certain disadvantage. Certain biases that were, that were made that way. Not that we did it to ourselves. We do it to ourselves. That's worse. Then you can't blame God. <laughs> right? You did it to yourself. You say, God, why didn't you stop me from this and that? God said, I not to stop you. Yeah. The Ramban in the book of Job mentioned this many times. The Ramban says, the person's going to get upstairs and blame God. He did this, he did that, he did the other thing. God says, what are you talking about? You transgressed cop in 614th commandment. Don't be stupid. Maybe the 615th commandment. Don't be a moron. I didn't tell you to do that. I didn't tell you to go down this path. You chose it. I didn't stop you. We're going to be shocked. Because the God's going to say, you're going to blame me for that? I didn't stop you. I allowed you to do it. Okay. Yeah, it's worse when we do it to ourselves. God doesn't have to stop us. If you want to go on the right path, God will help you. If you want to go on the wrong path, God doesn't have to stop you. 
famous example, football player. You know, prime is live, jumps in. You know, a bunch of people drowning. He himself drowned. I think two, three people drowned. One person was saved. Exactly what the numbers I don't remember. He gets upstairs, I guarantee. Go, you know, thank God, why didn't you save me? I was doing a big mitzvah. Yeah, I don't think he's going to say that, but I was doing a good act. It's good they're doing a good deed over here. I was saving them from drowning. So when I was 15, taking junior life saving, you don't jump in if you don't know what you're doing. Because if you jump in, they're going to drown you first. You got to know how to deal with them. Because otherwise, they're, they're struggling to survive. They'll drown you. So God's going to look down. God's going to look at this guy, whatever, as a soul. He's going to say, what are you talking about? Did I tell you to jump in? You didn't know how to swim. Did I tell you to jump in? It's a danger, don't you know? You don't do things that are dangerous. If it's a suffix, it's a doubt whether it's dangerous. Very good. Right? If something bad happens, Okay. If it, you know for sure it's bad, right, and it's dangerous, you know, let's do it. Ah, oh, but it was adrenaline. It was my cousin. It was this one. It was God says, I didn't tell you to jump. No one put, you know, <laughs> Mr. S put a gun to your head and said to do it because the adrenaline was going. And then you're going to be the hero or whatever. Whatever convinced you to jump in, right? But God would say, God would say very simple, I didn't tell you to jump. And who in your right mind would jump if you don't know how to swim? Especially if people were drowning. So what if we watch them drown? Right? If there's, Sometimes there's nothing you can do. You try and throw something to them. I don't know. Whatever it is, you do everything you can, but you jump in, you're, you're risking your life. That can be called suicide. Because you don't know how to swim. If a person knows how to swim very well, they jump in. Yeah, but the but the tide is very strong, you know, and they drown. It's a different issue. But they know how to swim. You gotta say, but they didn't know the current is whatever it is. Yeah. Not necessarily for me to judge you. This is, you know, for God to judge. But if it's a dangerous situation, right? What I know is you don't do it. You know, jump in. People are gonna say, burning building, you jump, you know, brother runs in, drives safe lines, let's say the building explodes. The house explodes or, you know, they're overcome by smoke inhalation or whatever. You know, I say he's a real hero. Okay. How is God going to judge it? Like I said, it's a burning building. It's my family. How can I not go in? You're, you're not allowed to put your life in danger. If it's a doubt, that's a different issue. Meaning if it's not clear it's a danger, okay. If something happens, you're not liable. You wouldn't be liable over here for negligence. But the fact is, if it's 100% dangerous, and you know it's dangerous, you can't do it. You cannot do it under the circumstances. So, so again, so someone's going to say, I know the outdoor Orthodox will be upset with me. You're darn right we're going to be upset because that goes against the book of Exodus in Leviticus chapter 18. It says you can't be homosexual. I don't care how the person's brought up, this and that. Everyone's got free choice. Everyone's got free choice. Person made a choice. Said I was put in the wrong body. I don't know. I wouldn't say that. You know, I wouldn't say that. Because according to Kabbalah, God puts the soul in every body. He convinces the soul to go in, and he puts the soul in every body that he determines which body is the best one for the soul. Doesn't matter what the parents are, siblings are, the soul has no choice. Right? You have no choice, Mr. Perky Elbow says. Right? Says in ethics for our fathers. You're born against your will, you die against your will. So now you're saying, I was put in the wrong body. You know what that means? That you're God. You know better than God. Who puts the soul, who breathes in the spirit of life? Right? Right? Genesis, beginning of Genesis, who breathes in the spirit of life, i.e. the soul? What does God say? What, what, what does the Torah say? The Torah says God breathed in the spirit of life to man. He gives man life. Right? So you got a man, you got a, a man and a woman, right? Create the child. The child doesn't live, it doesn't have a soul. God has to put the soul in. Right? Soul doesn't go in, the child doesn't come out. Yeah. God breathes in the spirit of life. He puts the soul into man. So now you're saying, or a person is saying, well, you, you know. I was put in the wrong body. So what are you saying? <laughs> Essentially, 
You're saying, I know better than God, because God's the one who did it. I know better than God. That's heresy. Now, if a person's born, you know, with both male and female genitalia, okay, Gamora already says, the Mishnah brings down, it can happen. That can happen. Now, the question is, and I'm not the one to ask answer this question, but the question is, okay, now you're going to separate. Is it going to be a male or a female? Now, the, if you don't separate, though, there are a lot of questions. You know, certain things, maybe that person will be exempt from, let's say, prayer, because it's is bound by time, because part of them is a woman. Yeah? There'll be a lot of questions, what they're allowed to do, not allowed to do. Can they fulfill someone's obligation? They make a blessing. Let's say they make a blessing. Someone's drunk on... Pour them. They can't. They can't make. Let's say they wash their hands for bread. There's got male and female genitalia. He says, "I'll say it for you, right? I'll say it. You answer, Amen, right? Shmir koina. You hear it. I'll say it. You have intention. I'll have intention. Can you fulfill their obligation? No. Cannot fulfill their obligation because part of them's a woman. And this whole question the Gemara says is a woman obligated in Berakas Amazon in grace after meals like a man on a Torah level or not? The Gemara goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth for a long time. So it's a long discussion. Yes, no, yes, no, this, that. Comes out, comes out that a woman does not have a Torah obligation. Right? Same way, doesn't have a Torah obligation. Now, in a certain ways, she could. She could fulfill the obligation for a man because she's obligated. Right? She's obligated over here, but there are certain things she can't do. So now I get a problem. What do I do? Right? So that's a real issue. That is a real issue. So in the other case, this person felt they were female the whole time and the parents made a wrong decision, but kid was only a child when they did it. That might be a whole different discussion. That might be she's really born a woman. Could be. I mean, it's not for me to answer. I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure. It could be that there's no problem over here. There's no, there's no transgender over here. Because really, they were born a woman. Right? Essentially, they were born a woman. Right? So if they were born a woman, Right? And if they were born a woman, okay. You know, but they were born a man also, but they made the wrong choice. Okay. Right? So I could hear that they're really a woman. You know, regardless of how, you know, of what the decision the parents made. Okay, it's a more complicated question. Right? But the bottom line, I don't want to get off my train of thought here. The bottom line is someone who says, goes against Leviticus chapter 18, Right and says that you know homosexuality is not the it's not the person's fault. Whose fault is it? They're born that way. There's no homosexual gene. I hate to tell you, never been proven. Not even according to science. Yeah, never been proven. So if it's never been proven, whose fault is it? It's an abnormal desire. So it says clear. It says a man should cleave to a woman, not to another man. Now, could a person have other issues? Yeah, could be other issues. Okay. Yeah. But you can't say, you know, that's like saying, that's like saying God made me something I'm not. That is impossible. That is impossible. God put me in the wrong body, right? Or, or the person will say, I'm in the wrong body. It should have been in the body of a woman, not a man. Or vice versa. Essentially, they're saying <laughs> what God does is wrong. Because if, if God breathes in the spirit of life, he's the one doing it. What he's saying? He's making a mistake? That's what the person's saying, essentially. God doesn't know what he's doing. You want to listen to someone like that? I don't care if he's got a million Jews. Ten million Jews. You take what that person says, you flush it down the toilet with a capital F. Yeah, you flush him. Wouldn't trust anything the person says. That's heresy 101. Right? So, again, as we always say, you got to be careful who you listen to. And certainly, her rabbinical court should, you know, you got to check them out. Are they valid? You know? Is it something where I'm going to have an issue later on? Right now, there's no guarantee for that, by the way. I'm going <laughs> to I'm gonna dispel that right now. Right? There is no guarantee because something can happen. You know? But if you go to a proper rabbinical court, yeah, should there be issues 10 years down the line? No. 
Shouldn't be any issue. Could there be? In theory. Right? I, I work with somebody where, you know, they had a proper conversion. One of the rabbis got bounced off the rabbinical court for, let's just say, improper behavior. Yeah? Now, what does that mean? It means like retroactively, they only had two people on the based it. You need three. So it's like they had no rabbinical court. Gary's a former stringent conversion. And that's what they did. They, you know, they moved here. And that's what they had to do. But, you know, based on missed certain things also and other things. Would that, you know, complicate the issue a little bit? But, you know, again, is it possible something like that could happen? It's possible. It's possible. Yeah. Or what, let's say there was a rabbinical court 20 years ago, 30 years ago, doing proper conversions. In the last 10, 15 years, the conversion is not worth anything. Yeah, so what about the conversion they did before? So you, can, you can say all of them are bad. Maybe some of them were good. You get to see on, on an individual basis. I know somebody that had a conversion was probably fine. You know, but they did a they did a stringent conversion because they didn't want to have any problems. They didn't want to have any doubts. So it's not foolproof, but, you know, we do our best to make sure wherever a person is going to go, they're going to go, you know, they're going to go to a place where there shouldn't be any issues. Now, again, is that 100% foolproof? No. The only things that are foolproof, you know, guaranteed on life, death, and taxes, not necessarily that order. That's it. Right? But again, the person went to a proper rabbinical court, you shouldn't have any issues. All right. I know there are going to be a lot of questions here. Let's see. One question. Oh, well, a lot of questions here. Um, Sneas is a must for non Jewish women. Nope. Right? For non Jewish women, the law is a modesty. Does a woman, does a woman have to, um, um, does a woman have to wear, uh, what do you call it? Proper uh, clothing. Does it have to cover her neck, her elbows, right? Does she always have to wear a skirt? No. I would say, I would definitely say, though, there is a uh, moral imperative, you know, that women should dress properly, right? That they should be modest, but, you know, for themselves. <laughs> Not necessarily because the Torah says anything about it. The Torah doesn't. So a woman wants to dress however, you know, she wants to dress to kill in the summer, you know, wear short, short, shorts and let everything hang out, no pun intended, right? We'll keep this clean. It's her choice. Is it forbidden? No. Is there a moral imperative? I would say yes. Just for herself, but no obligation, right? I said, well, Sasu doesn't apply to non-Jewish men, right? The, the, the When we say, when we say the Shema, we say, don't go after your heart, don't go after your eyes. Right? So the Rambam learns, Lo Sasur, don't go after your eyes or after your heart. Right? Or after, right after your heart. Right? That applies to men and women. Jews. Does not apply to non Jews. Right? So again, even, you know, can a non Jewish man, you know, stare at women? Yeah. Is it good for him? No. Definitely not good. You know, can they watch inappropriate things? Technically, is there anything wrong with it? Do you say? <laughs> you know, so you say, well, you know, it's not reality, it's this, it's other things. True. Is it forbidden? Right? That's the question. For men, for Jewish men, yeah, for sure it'd be forbidden. For women also. Women also, even if it's not acted on it. Right? Even if it's not acted on it. So uh, I would say for for the sake of uh, non-Jews, I would say no. It's not a problem, right? The question is, is it, you know, when we when we say something's universal, universal according to the Torah, what does that mean? Right? If it doesn't make sense logically, in our eyes, right, according to the Torah, then for non-Jews to be permitted, right? So in this case, now, a person can make all kinds of claims why it's bad. Yeah? Why, why, you know, why, you know, immorality, why it's bad. And, and different things. Right? Even secular literature, you know, you know, they'll say why it's bad and this and that. Okay. But that doesn't mean it's forbidden for non-Jews. Right? Doesn't mean it's bad for non It's forbidden. 
Would I? Would, do I think it's good? No, I don't think it's good. I would say again. I would say it's a moral imperative. It's not good. Obligation for non-Jews? No. Some say okay. Another question. Got a lot of questions here. Uh, Moabite men were not allowed to become converts. Why? Because they didn't greet the Jews. Women were allowed because Shem didn't expect them to greet Jews due to sneeze reasons. Okay. Right? But that's, you know, for a modesty reason. Okay, keep in mind, this is the whole question about Ruth, right? If Ruth is a non-Jew, right, and she came from Moabite, so it says Moabites can't convert. Right? Now, we understand King David has to be Jewish. Right? She, so Ruth you know, has to, has to be Jewish over here. Now, someone once said, but, you know, you only need King David's mother to be Jewish, so there's an issue. Because the, the, the you know, any time someone was a Moabite, whoever they married, they stayed a Moabite, whether, whether the woman was Jewish, right? In other words, the child still had the status of a Moabite. So since the child had the status of a Moabite for all generations, it's a Moabite. So even if the mother, King David's mother was Jewish, had the status of a Moabite, doesn't help. Right, that that wouldn't help. But in general, in general, what's what's so what's the answer? So King David has to be Jewish. So what's the answer? It must be that Ruth's allowed to convert. Iba says no Moabites, no Moabites allowed to convert. So the the answer is we have one answer is according to according to oral law that the rabbis tell us what's the answer because oral law tells us. It's only going on in Gezerah. It's not the decree's only on the men because they didn't go out. They didn't go out and help. You know, when the Jews were coming through, they didn't. They didn't help. So they're not allowed to convert, but the women were allowed, and that wasn't so well known. That's why we read the book of Ruth. One of the reasons we read the book of Ruth on on Shavuos because, first of all, we were all like converts in Mount Sinai, right? When it came to Mount Sinai, but also, also this was not a well known law in King David's legitimacy, so to speak. Right, his genealogy would have been impaired, you know, would have been problematic. Right, so here it wasn't really well known that it was only the man, only the Moabite man that wasn't allowed. Right, but the woman was allowed. So here it reinforced, reinforced oral law. Is there such a thing as a one night stand for Noahs? Why? Um, I would say, first of all, if a Noah lives together with a woman, she is they're considered married. That's marriage. Right? Anytime any one of them walks out, that's divorce. Certainly according to Maimonides, the Rambam and others. Right? Why? Why? Because they don't have any obligation. They don't have any obligation to be married, per se. Right? Ma they don't have to go through a formal marriage ceremony. So for Noahites, for Noahites, they're obligated to have children. Right? Right? They can't commit adultery and other things. So if this is not adultery, it's not a forbidden relationship, technically it'd be permissible. Right? What about premarital sex? Same question. Even if you're going to stay with the same person, what? So same question. Yeah, same question. Yeah, what's the answer? What's the answer again? Is it a good thing for them to do? No. Right? It shouldn't be forbidden. But I would think I would think it comes again under under the category of not a good thing to do as a moral imperative. Um, again, pro or vu, the myth of be fruitful and multiply for non-Jews, not the same for Jews. Right, it's not the same as Jews, right? They, you know, they want to use um, contraception, you know, whatever. They can have one child every five years, every eight years, you know, whatever. The same things do not apply between Jews and non-Jews. There's, no, you know, the the only mitzvah by non-Jews to have children, because if you didn't have children, the world won't be populated. You need the world to be populated, right? So it's not necessarily a mitzvah to be fruitful. Mother. By the mitzvah to populate the world. Um, Jews, okay. Yeah, so what's the big deal? Yeah, does that mean when he has a daughter one day, boy will do the same thing to his daughter? Where, again, what's the problem? A Noahide man has intimacy with the shiksa. She's a non Jew. I know, I don't understand the question. A Noahide and a non Jewish woman, they're both non Jews. Even if the non Jewish woman, let's say, is a Christian or a Buddhist, right? The old day of Otis are liable for a death penalty, right? Death penalty for what? For idolatry. Okay. Can a Noahide be married to an idolatrous woman? Yes. Can they have children together? Yes. Now, is it going to be an issue? Are the children going to be raised? Yeah. That's going to be an issue. Yeah, but it doesn't mean it's forbidden. Does not mean it's forbidden. So, 
So a no-eyed man with a non-Jewish woman is not going to make any difference. She's not Jewish, right? Now, does that mean that, you know, if they have a child, they're going to do the same thing? You have no idea, right? People should not ask these questions, right? Why, why do I say people shouldn't ask these questions? I'm not, not picking on you. Because they're going to a lot of people. The measure for measure many, many times, I'll tell you, you'll never figure it out. You'll never, ever figure it out. And if you're never, ever going to figure it out, don't even bother. Don't even bother with the question. Well, maybe it's measure for measure for this. People say on October 7th, look what happens. There was a Buddha there. It was idolatry. There was immorality and all kinds of other things going on. Desecration of Shabbos and the whole thing. Well, isn't that measure for measure? God punished them in such a way? Nobody knows why. Nobody can say why. Great rabbi said we don't know why. Yeah, what they did didn't help. Let, let's say that. What they did for sure didn't help. But there was already a decree made. You got to remember, by Rosh Hashanah, the decree was made. Everybody there that was supposed to die in that way were supposed to die. That was the decree. It wasn't something that they did on that day that God said, okay, I'm going to nail them right now. And even if a person would say, well, isn't that what the punishment is? And we can see, correct? You don't know. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. This question comes up many, many times. I want to know the measure for measure. We're not going to know. Moses himself at the 48th level of knowledge, right? He didn't reach the highest level of knowledge. And Moses himself asked, God, I want to see you face to face. God says, no one can see my face and live. You can only see me from behind. See me from behind. What does that mean? It means that you're not going to understand what's going on in this world. You're not going to understand. Well, I'll give an example. There's a measure that says, but well, you know, that the Egyptians were using babies for mortar. Yeah. Moses says one of the, was going to save one of the babies. God says it's not a good idea. Moses does it anyway. And who's the baby become? Achav, evil king of the Jewish people. Moses thinks he's doing a great thing. Right? I'm not here to <laughs> say otherwise. Right? But God knew better. God knows the future. So you're right. It looks terrible. This baby's being used for mortar. You're being used for bricks. Baby's going to die. You're right. Looks really bad. Right? Anybody would say that. But the fact is, God knows the future. So God says, I know what I'm doing. Most of let me save the baby. I goes, okay. You want to save the baby? You know, you want to go against what I said? Okay. You think you know better? This is what happened. The measure for measure, we don't know. We'll never know. Right? Impossible. You know, in many ways. Maybe. One day, God will throw you a proverbial bone. Maybe many years later. Maybe you'll get it. Maybe. In general, we don't know. No, impossible. What if a shiksa and a father is okay with a modest act? No. No. That's forbidden. Right? A child, what's that? The Rambam says clear. One of the, one of the, um, one of the laws, one of the no laws, when it comes to uh, immorality, is a, is a father and a child. Even for no eyes, that's forbidden. Yeah, that, that would be forbidden. They're liable for death penalty. If he commits a similar idea, I'll repeat, I'll repent. Repentance, remember. For a Jew, that doesn't work. For sure, it doesn't work. If a Jew says, I'll repent, you know, and then, and then um, I'll, do the, I'll do the transgression, I'll repent. You know, for a Jew, that doesn't work. Repentance by non-Jew is a totally different thing. Totally different thing. Why? Because when a Jew repents, and he properly repents, it uproots the whole thing. By a non-Jew, what does it do? It stops them from being punished. Stops them from being punished. So now, if a, if a non-Jew says, I will repent for this later, yeah, it's a libel for a death penalty. What happens? I'll ask you a theoretical question. They bow down to an idol and they're thinking, okay, I'm going to repent later. But guess what? A Jew saw him bow down to Mr. Buddha, Mr. Fatso himself. This guy bows down to Fatso. John over here bows down to Fatso, right? A Jew sees him, he can take a gun and shoot him straight away. Repentance ain't going to help, right? If he says, I'll repent later, he may not have a chance to repent. <laughs> He's already liable for death penalty. He's already liable for the death penalty and someone gets him, repentance ain't going to help. Right? And this shouldn't help. This only applies to a Jew, not a non-Jew. 
right? That 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 uh, for a Jew it won't work, right? And for an orange, it also should work, right? It depends what they do, also, right? It depends, you know, you know, I I, I should I would think it, it shouldn't work either, right? I I I would think that that um, it for sure shouldn't work. Why isn't our education free? Yeah, was it ever free? Well, people say, people complain to me sometimes. They'll say, Moses didn't charge anyone charging people in the desert. Yeah, because God made him rich. God take care of his needs. Right? You would never ask this question by a plumber, by a doctor. You wouldn't ask it by, I don't know, someone comes to fix your washing machine. Computer technician. Right? It's only about education. <laughs> right? It's only about our education. Yeah, it, it, It's cognitive dissonance. Right, I had somebody once a number of years ago fix my washing machine, right? And something else went wrong. Right. I called him back. I said, Do I get a do I get a discount? He goes, No, it's a totally different problem. Yeah. Right? Now I'm gonna sit there and haggle with him. I didn't get a, you know, he give me a discount. I didn't haggle with him. Other people might haggle with him, but listen, a friend of mine's a computer consultant, he said, he says, if you couldn't figure out how to turn on your computer, you told me to come and fix it, I'm charging you a hundred bucks. You know, God said, don't be stupid. Yeah. No one's going to argue this. Nobody. Yeah. I mean, was child education ever free? I think people paid something for sure. They had to pay something. Right. How's the one teaching going to live? Makes sense. Like anything else. Right. Was it, you know, was it ever totally free? I don't think it was ever totally free. I don't think it was ever totally free that, you know, they had to be paid something. You know, totally had to be paid something. Um, you know, rabbis had other jobs. They didn't want to make money from Torah. That's a different issue. Right? Someone there says, you know, he was a wood chopper, this, that. You're right. They had other professions. But that's not because Torah should be free. That's a different issue. Right? Why, why is that a different issue? Because because there's an issue of making money from Torah. Right? I've gotten that question also. How can you charge for classes? Because my time's worth something. You wouldn't ask that on any other profession. No other profession would get this question. Right? So you're right. They did other things, not because they didn't, not, not because it was free. They did it because they didn't want to get benefit from Torah, from their Torah knowledge. So, so today you're paying someone for their expertise, right? There, is the question: Can you take money for Torah? See, you're trying to teach them Torah, but it's more or less classroom control. That's what you're paying for, yeah. And what about other people? What about other people? You know, they want to pay. What if someone can't pay? What if someone can't pay? They should also be taught. I'll tell people that all the time. They can't pay. I'll take them anyway. Yeah. But time is worth something. I don't, I don't, I don't think there's any question. Right? I, I don't think there's any question. You know, they, the, the question is, they didn't, want to, they didn't want to get money for their learning. They didn't want to take money for their, they didn't want to get benefit from their Torah learning. Right? So they had all the jobs. Yeah, but they were really poor. <laughs> so a lot of rabbis were really poor. There are plenty of rabbis out there today, even rabbis of congregation, they have other jobs because it doesn't pay them enough. Yeah, but but today, today's a different issue. Um, it's playing chess motion of late. Is it wasting time or bitle or 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 uh, uh is it wasting time or you know just you know sitting around um for non-Jews? No, they want to do it, they don't have they don't have a problem. Right, they don't have a they don't they don't have a problem. Um they don't have a problem for it. um I thought, question for the story of Purim, simple explanation. They were okay, you're in and out, this and that, whatever. Right? But the fact that they had too much enjoyment, that's why they're liable for death penalty. Um, yeah, let me see here. Um, 
someone said that women I spoke with were married, none had wigs, said the rabbi's wife. <laughs> okay, wigs is another issue. I'm saying, you know, what about covering their hair? Right? So they have to cover, they should cover their hair. Um, you know, there, there's an issue. There, there's there, there, there's a definite, you know, there, there's there's a definite issue. Um, they should cover their hair. But, you know, people in the modern Orthodox community say, and even great rabbis' wives didn't have their hair covered. You know, I, I don't know why it's something to brag about. I don't know why, you know, I don't, I don't have a good answer. I don't think they have a good answer for that. Um, someone asked me, a software engineer working on gambling platform. Oh, a website with the modest pictures allowed. For a non-Jew, yeah, for a non-Jew, it's less of an issue. For a Jew, it would probably be more of an issue. Definitely more of an issue. Uh, would it be forbidden? Yeah, it's probably not a good thing for sure. You know, that's definitely for sure. If there's, you know, if they're if you're a guy and there are modest women there, yeah, that would definitely be a problem. For you know, for a non-Jew, I would say again, I would say the moral imperative. It's not a good thing. You know, as, definitely the moral imperative. But as a as a something forbidden. You know, I wouldn't say it's forbidden. Uh, uh, there's an issue also. There's an issue also. You know, again, what you know, again, what's the question here? Question. The, the question is, you know, that we all have to ask, Jews and non-Jews, is this something that draws me closer to God or not? Right. These are questions we have to ask. If it's something questionable, you got to ask. If it's something you know you know it's not going to draw you closer to God, just the opposite, that's a problem. Right? That, that would definitely be a problem. Right? Now, some people will fool themselves and say, this is making me much closer. It's doing these other things. And it's a lie. It's the evil inclination. Right? That, you know, definitely the, you know, the evil inclination. I had a question someone once asked, you know, they can make a lot of money game. You know, playing video games, people watching them and, you know, whatever. So, you know, I basically said it's probably not a good thing to do, right? Spend all your time doing that, whatever. You know, sometime you want to do that, you're, you know, you need to make money doing that. Okay, not, uh, I'm not going to say it's forbidden. You know, gambling, let's, let's throw that in there. It's gambling forbidden for non-Jews, right? For, for Jews, it's a problem. It's only a problem for Jews. It's only a problem for Jews if that's their parnosa, if that's what they're making money from, right? Let's say, I had this question many years ago, let's say someone's retired. Yeah, someone's retired, their money, I don't know, is in different things. And they go gambling three, four, five times a year. Right? They go to Las Vegas, go to Atlantic City, go to other places. Right? Is that like they you know they're not working? Right? Is that like the, the Gemara says, you know, they're not doing Yeshu Yeshu They're not like doing anything for the world. They're gambling. Right? There, right. There, there, are few different, yeah. there are a few different there are a few different issues. One second, there are a few different issues. So based on that, they're not doing it all the time. They're only doing a handful of times, right? But even if someone else is making their money, it's like they, they're making a living. So if they're making a living, you know, that should not be an issue. For non-Jews, again, is it a good thing? I wouldn't say it's a good thing. Why? Because the person loses. You know, if you're only going to lose a certain amount, you're in control. It's one thing. But, you know, it can go steady out of control. Yeah, question. Someone had a question? All right, one second. Um, Can I ask you a question, Rabbi? Yeah, go ahead. Um, let me ask you: if you met if you met a woman and she's converting, are you allowed to see her? I would say like this: it's better, it's better not to date until after conversion. Complicates things. But what do you because... do? If the, what do you do if the woman is in like? You're, you know, you're in one state. She's in another state, far out. What do you, what do you do in such a case? Because the question is, is that she? I know she said she, you know, she would like to try to meet, but I, you know, I know she's trying to convert. What if it takes her? You know, how how long can it take to get out of this class? <laughs> Come on, how long can it take? It can take a while. I mean, you know, how long is it going to take her to convert? It'll take her a year or two for sure. Right? You know who well, she I, is? Again, that, that, that Cassandra Springford, is it? 
it, 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 depends, it depends it depends where a person's holding and you know the whole thing it could take a couple of years for sure so you think she'll right? be out yeah. sooner that cassandra woman would she be out sooner i have no idea depends depends on a lot of different factors you know per, a person has to move you know that to be accepted by a rabbinical court you know the process does not take less than two years right it does not take less than two years if it takes less than two years you know you know good luck I, I I haven't seen it it's, again. If a person moves to a Jewish community, very good, right? They're not going to look at it. You know, they may see if a person has knowledge, right? If the person has knowledge, they move into a Jewish community, very good. Does that mean if they, you know, even if they have world class knowledge, they're going to convert them on the spot? No, they're going to convert no, them in six months to a year, maybe, maybe. Right. You know, you you know, it depends on it depends on. It depends on the circumstance. The rabbinical court's going to want to see somebody live in the community for at least a year before they're going to convert them. I had someone that was ready to convert. Rabbinical court where they were wasn't worth very much. They went to a... I sent them across the country. took them twice to go. Within another year, they converted. But they were, you know... You know, they had to be in a community at least for a year. I'd be very surprised. I'm not saying it won't happen, but I would be very surprised if someone was in a community less than that, you know, less than that, and they converted. Now it could be they're under, you know, under different circumstances. But in, you know, in general, you know, in in, in general, it takes at least, you know, I've classes for a year and a half, but it takes at least a year to really know what you're doing, or could be longer, you know, before you're putting it into practice, you know, and and where do, where does it get solidified? When you move to a community, because then you see it in action. It's not the same, you know, doing right. it by yourself, not the same as seeing it on YouTube. So, you know, it can definitely, you know, you know, it can definitely, it can definitely take time. It's not, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, three to five years, it doesn't have to be longer than that. But you know, they, they, they have to get the knowledge. The knowledge is not, you know, the knowledge does not come overnight. And it's better, it's a lot better, make all the mistakes now. You know, they convert. Everyone's in a rush to convert. I hear this all the time. Everyone's in a rush to convert, right? It's not to their benefit. I'm not saying it has to take forever, but it's not in their benefit. Well, because no, I'm, I'm, they, not, I'm, I'm, because, I'm a regular, I'm a regular Jew. No, I'm orthodox, Lubavitch. No, I understand. I'm, but I'm saying for a non-Jew to convert, why is it the Gemara says that not, that converts get slapped up the side, up the side of a head after after conversion, after conversion because they didn't learn properly before they converted. It's one reason. Right, understanding. It's, it's one reason. So you make all the mistakes now, right? Where, where, you make you, where, are, you where are you teaching from, Israel? I'm in Israel, yeah. Do you, do you happen uh, to know the Boston area? No. You don't? No. Okay. Um, yeah. So that's what, you know, that, that's what I would say. But it's, you know, again, you know, people think, you know, I just want to get to the finish line. Good. Get to the finish line. Proper knowledge. You know, do it right. You know, it shouldn't take that long. But the knowledge itself, there's there's a lot of information. You know, there, there, there's a lot, you know, there, there, there's a lot of information. So better to make all the mistakes now. Does that mean you're not going to make mistakes later? Hopefully not. But, you know, the, 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 uh, a person will see the more they learn, the more they learn, the more, <laughs> Well, they realize what you know, what they don't know, you know, and what's you know, and what questions, um, you know, what questions, um, you know, come up. Like, you know, there there are things that have come up. Let's say in the laws of kosher's. I use kosher's right. as an example. Yeah. Sure, yeah. So someone, someone, someone took a, someone took a meat fork, and sorry, a, a milk fork, you know, and stirred spaghetti and meatballs. Yeah. Stirred spaghetti and meatballs, and the spaghetti and meatballs are piping hot. So there's going to be a lot of questions here. Well, you know, one question, axiomatic principle, when was the pot used? Was the pot used within 24 hours? You know, does it have, you know, you know real meat, this, that? So now there are three questions. Question of the fork, question of the, of the food, question of the pot. Now, if they don't okay. understand how bitter works, how nullification works, and all that, they're not going to understand the question. Right? They're not going to understand That's what the rabbi is going to ask them. Now, Perfect. is that something, you know, is that something necessarily a... You know, based in a rabbinical court's going to ask? No, they're not necessarily going to ask you that. But that is something, at least in the kitchen, you have to know what's the question or not. Let's say I'll give an example. I'll give another example. You take a meat knife, meat knife not used within 24 hours, you cut an onion. Very good. Yeah, you cut an onion. Now, you put that onion, 
you put that onion into uh, into noodles with cheese. That's forbidden. The whole thing is forbidden. Why? I can't do because, that. Why, yeah, why would no, you do you something do like it. that? <laughs> why would you do it? Because who says, what's the problem? I took it. So, okay, so what if you took a meat knife? The meat knife wasn't Lord. used within 24 hours, but you cut something sharp. Once I cut something sharp, it reinvigorates the knife. Now it's got like real meat taste. Right on the knife, and I put I put this onion now, not me. Someone else put the onion right in a pot of of noodles with cheese. That onion is a hundred percent meat. That is now a forbidden mixture of milk and meat. Yeah, yeah right. that is something people have to know. Right? Otherwise, yeah, but otherwise I, think you'll some, make... I think something like that, Rabbi. I think something like that. After you, you know, you might mention it. They should, if they can pick it up quick, they should realize it that you're not. You know, I'm sure they can realize you're not supposed to mix milk, milk and meat together but using any type of utensils yeah, or anything. Who's going to figure that out? Who's going to figure out a knife with an onion? Who's going to who's going to say that if something sharp with the pressing of the knife with the onion is going to make a forbidden mixture of milk and meat? There's no meat on the knife. But the question is, the, doesn't matter because if you have if you have a phlegetic area and a, and a milk area, you should realize it. Label it. Put labels on it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't. That, that, you're right. I, I I would agree. I'm just pointing out these are simple things that you have to know, right? And you have to put into practice. Right. And if you don't put into practice, you'll make mistakes, right? The well, that's why I'm, only, said, I'm only asking. One second, I'm asking so that you can at least try to push this class so you can get this woman out. I'd like to meet her. That's why I'm trying to have if you can push this it, class a little but, bit. But you know what? The classes go as they go, right? There's no speed. Right. There's no speed course here. Bottom line. Right. That, 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 that's the bottom line. So, you know, at the end of the day, there are things you got to know and you got to do. It. And that's it. Right. And, and you got to you got to do it the right way, because if you don't do it the right way, I guarantee I guarantee, you know, you, there, there are going to be problems. The Hopeless Chaim says clear in the Mishra Brewer, his introduction, if you don't constantly study the laws of Shabbos, you will transgress. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. You will yeah. transgress. Um. So here you're talking about something that's totally new for most people. So you got to get it done, right? I'm not saying it, it right, should yes. take that long to do it, but if you don't, you know, you know, if you don't practice it, you don't live it, right? All the time, you know, it's not going to, um, you know, it's not going to happen. Uh, they, they yeah. should, that means they, what they have to do is practice after the class is ended. They should go and try it 100%. and practice what they're doing, 100%. so that that way they can get out of this class. Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, no, I just hope that this woman gets out soon because I'd like to meet her. I mean, I've you know I've texted with her, but you can't do anything until she can get out of this right. class. It looks like. Understood. Unless Understood. she can get on a, unless she can get with the rabbi on one on one and try to push her to get out of this class. Uh huh. All right, I'm gonna stop here. I do this every uh, Tuesday and Thursday, ten o'clock Eastern time, five o'clock normally Israel time, but it's an hour earlier because we didn't change the clocks. Otherwise, if anyone has any questions, find me on Facebook at Michael Kaufman, Beyond Orthodox Conversion and Judaism, OrthodoxConversion.com, or Michael Kaufman at gmail.com, R B B I C H A I M C O F F M A N 